Hello everybody and welcome to First Chapter Friday, number two. Um, so today I chose the book From the Ashes by Jesse Thistle and it is a um, current novel and it is um, more memoir based so kind of more true account of his life. Yeah, so 2019 is when this book came out. Um, you, on the back too, like Amanda Lindhout, who wrote House in the Sky, which is an author from Red Deer, she recommends this one as well. Um, and so the focus is on Jesse himself, um, who found himself in the foster care system with his two brothers, um, because they were abandoned by their parents and then throughout it all, like some drug addiction, destructive lifestyle, and kind of all a result of like residential schools and the 60s scoop and um, that's mentioned. What's really interesting too with this book is um, there's some poetry at some of the start of the chapters, which I kind of find interesting. Um, yeah, so that's what I'll be reading to you today. <clears throat> the dead silence screamed danger frenzied squeaks of jail issued blue deck shoes on sealed cement followed by wet smacks fast pops loud cracks and finally a dull thud confirmed it a guy lay crumpled on the range floor our range quartermaster told us he wasn't conscious his legs were seized straight quivering quivering uncontrollab uncontrollably he had urinated himself we didn't need to see it with our own eyes. The unseen, the unknown in jail is often worse than the seen, the known. The next day after cell search, I heard that he had died en route to the hospital. Someone said he'd stolen a bag of chips from another inmate's canteen, but who knew? Who cared? It was jail justice. The thief got what he deserved. According to us, according to society, at least that's what I told myself. All I knew for sure was that I didn't know anything and I hadn't seen anything. I'd only heard it, but I wouldn't even tell the guards that much. I had to survive. And the only way you did that was by keeping your mouth shut, turning your head away. But was, what was I doing here in jail anyway? Why had I put myself in the midst of this filth, this horrible violence? The answer was simple. I did it to save my leg and my life. My cookum Nancy's palm felt leathery in mine as we walked alongside of the train tracks. Stands of poplar swayed and bent in the wind, and she stood still for a second to catch her bearings and watch the flat-bottomed late spring clouds slouch by. She mumbled, then began thrusting her gnarled walking stick into the tall brush ahead, spreading it open, looking for flashes of purple or blue. Purple was a clear sign that pregnant Saskatoon berry bushes were ready to give birth, and ease the winter suffering of bears, birds, and humans. Berries, Cookham said, knew well their role as life givers, and we had to honor and respect that. We did that by knowing our role as responsible harvesters, picking only what we needed and leaving the rest for our animal kin so they could feed themselves and their young. That was our pact, she said. If we followed it, they'd never let us down. My Cookham wore brownish yellow eyeglasses the size of teacup saucers, but her eyes could still th see things my three-year-old eyes couldn't. I always tried to search out berry patches before she did, but she always got there first, always. As we waded deeper through the rail side, grass and reeds, a vast fleet of mosquitoes and gnats lifted from the ditch floor and enveloped our heads. And a few flew into my mouth, choking me. I coughed and batted at the air. No, Jesse, Cookham grabbed my arms and held them. They are our relatives, never do that. I'd never seen her angry before, but she was now. As the black cloud intensified around us, she drew in a deep breath, closed her eyes, and spoke softly in mischief. She pointed to me and our half full pail of berries and then to the rat root plant that protruded out of her dress pocket. Her voice sounded like warm summer air swooshing open the, over the open prairie right before the rain comes and reminded me of when I'd accidentally disturbed the hornet's nest behind the smoke shed. There was no anger in her voice then. The plume of insects hovered midair for a second, then flew skyward and dispersed, just like the hornets had done. I looked at her in amazement. 
and my mouth opened, but no sound came out. I strained to hear any buzzing, but there was only the call of the a loon far in the distance, followed by the shuffle of Cookham's moccasins. Oh, my silent one, Cookham said. I just told him we have a job to do. Her brown face cracked into a smile. I asked them to visit us later if they must, but for now we need to concentrate. She brushed a few strands of my hair from my face and hoisted me over a puddle. Or maybe they're right, maybe it's quitting time. Let's get back, she garçon. We have enough to make some good panic. I loved Cookham's bannock more than anything, even harvesting with her, listening to her stories or hearing her sing. She made it wherever we visited. We lived in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, about an hour's drive from my grandparents. Their cabin was in Erin Ferry near Deb Debden, just south of Big River between the old Highway 1 on one side and the new Highway 55 on the other. The CN Railway cut right up the center of the road allowance connecting Dead Bend to Big River and on the rest to Saskatchewan. My grandparents' log cabin wasn't like any other place I knew. Mom told us that her dad, Musham Jeremy Morsiet, had made it by hand from the surrounding Aspen Harbor from our, after our family lost our homestead in Park Valley a few kilometers away. It took him one season to fell the trees, strip them of bark, build it, and the other half season to chink in the cracks with mud and moss, waterproof the roof, and make it ready for winter living. Nobody else had a neat house like my Cookham and Musham, way out in the country in the middle of nowhere with no water or electricity. Musham said there weren't many people like us anymore, rebels who fended for themselves. Maybe a few Arkin relatives down the road, but that was about it. The rest had sold out and got farms or went to the city to find work. He didn't own his land. It belonged to the Queen of England. She doesn't mind us being here, Musham said, and it lets me hunt and trap freely and be my own boss, which I like. He told us stories about how our people once had lived in large communities in handmade houses, just like this, all over Saskatchewan, living off the land, but that was before the government attacked us and stole our land during the resistance, before our clans fell apart. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I tried imagining villages of our people living like he and my cookum did in their little log house, all squished onto little pieces of land owned by the queen, and I couldn't. But there were beaver, muskrat, deer, bears, elk, and fish everywhere, forests, streams, and rivers all around to play in, and no neighbors for miles and miles. If someone tries to push us around, we just pick up and move somewhere else, Musham said. We like we live like this to be free, like our ancestors. I understood that. When Cookham and I came back from berry picking, Musham was standing at the front door of the cabin. The elkhorn buttons that fastened his beige leather vest strained to hold it together over his rounded stomach. Cookham made all of Musham's clothes from animals he trapped and materials she traded in for in Deadbin on her monthly visit to town. Where are Blanche and Sunny? Cookham called to him, her brow wrinkling. My parents' car had been in the dirt driveway when we left to go picking, but now there was just my Musham's plump horse drinking from the trough on the side of the house. They went into town. Should be back soon. Fire's ready, though. Cookham nodded, picking up a pail of rainwater for the washing and nudged Musham aside as she carried it inside. The smell of burnt hardwood licked all around my grandfather's bald head as he bent down to hug me. The press of his fancy vest against my exposed belly felt like thousands of soft pebbles. Blazes of prairie roses, wind flowers, big blue stems, lead plants and asters decorated his clothing in beaded patterns that Cookham said were passed down to her from her Michif Nehawa ancestors, mothers to daughters, for over two centuries. When Musham played the fiddle at night, I loved watching moonbeams flicker over his beads. It looked like he was wearing rubies and diamonds all over. And when he tapped his feet to the rhythm of reels, he told us were passed down from his grandfather's grandfather, the light lulled me to sleep. Josh and Jerry were inside the cabin playing on the floor with the wooden toys Musham had carved for them while they were out. Jerry's was a captain's sword and Josh's was a little marionette man that jiggled when you held the stick that protruded out his back. Musham could carve things in five minutes flat. Jerry always got the best toys because Jerry was his favorite grandson, being his namesake and all. Sometimes Josh and I would get jealous of Jerry. He crawled all over Musham's stomach and they both bellowed until tears came out of their eyes. Or Musham would take Jerry into the woods and show him his traps 
and a thing or two about snaring rabbits. He never did that with us. He'd hug us, but it wasn't the same. Jerry even kind of looked like him, stout, thick-legged, and broad across the shoulders. He was like Musham too, powerful, strong-willed, and stubborn. Josh was tall and thin. Out of all of us, he looked the most Indian, or at least that's what Mum would say when she brushed his long black hair in the morning. She always took her time with Josh, and I could see that he was her favorite. His skin was much darker than Jerry's and mine, and he looked more like Mum than Dad. Korean, or Japanese almost. Everyone was proud of Josh. He was the oldest and smartest, and talked the most. And whatever new clothes we got from our aunts and uncles went to him. I'd eventually get them, but not until after Josh and Jerry. I was much smaller and skinnier than both my brothers and had blonde shoulder length hair. My skin looked like my father's, pinkish cream. People were always saying, he looks like a little white boy, or you sure he wasn't switched at the hospital? Mom said it didn't matter because I was special. She said I was the largest of all her babies, a little over 10 pounds when I was born in 1976 as long as a carnival hot dog with a huge oblong head and the doctors were shocked when I came out. You didn't make a sound, Mum said. No screams or whimpers or nothing. Just went, just a wet plop sound. I stayed quiet my first three years. The most noise I'd make was a cry or an incomprehensible squeal of excitement. Look here, Musham said, as he placed me on the floor with my brothers. He pulled a small wooden knife out of his back pocket. It was just little enough for me to grasp. I waved it in front of him, and he jumped back. Jerry charged at me, coming to Musham's rescue. Musham scooped him up before he could impale me with his wooden saber. Heat and the smell of lard radiated from the wood stove. Cookham opened its door to chuck in a few logs, and the muscles on her arms rippled. She was strong. One time, a dog almost bit Josh near the road, and Cookham threw a cast iron skillet at it with one flick of her wrist like a ninja star. <laughs> the skillet whistled 30 feet in the air and the dog ran in the forest whining and never bugged any of us again. I watched her as she wiped the dirt off her hands and put rolled up bannock balls in the skillet. As they hissed and spit into the air, I could hear my parents' car screeching to a stop outside. They were fighting, like always. Musham said something to Cookham and Cree. I thought she was going to toss the frying pan, oil and all, out the door at my dad. She just wagged her head though. Mom leaned in the front door and announced, We're going home, boys. Pull your stuff together. Dad didn't come in. I peeked out the door. Music was blasting from the car. The windows were rolled up, and the inside was flooded with smoke. But Blanche, Cookham said, We picked berries for the bannock. Can't, Mom said. Sonny needs to get back. Damn idiot's gonna gotta meet someone. Come on, boys. Hurry it up. My mother was just 15 when she met my father in 1973 at her sister Bernadette's house in Deadburn, Saskatchewan. According to my aunties, my mother was just about the prettiest native girl in all northern Saskatchewan, a midriff Audrey Hepburn, crossed with Grace Kelly, silken black hair down to her waist, jet black eyes, and a smile like a midnight flame. They said men hovered around her like moths, and that dad was the first to lay eyes on her. He tripped over himself to catch her. <coughs> He chatted her up, bought her stuff, and fawned over her. He looked like a bumbling fool, my auntie said. All the men did. But Dad was different. He was an Algonquin Scot, although my uncles tell me he knew himself as a white man. He didn't look, he wasn't much to look at. Chubby around the middle, with pockmarked face and a broken fighter's teeth, with his usual jean outfit, was slick with traveler's patina. But there was something charming about him, an ability to talk and a boldness. That apparently came from his rough blue collar upbringing north of Toronto, where he learned to hustle or perish. He also loved rock music, Deep Purple, Jethro Tull, Black Sabbath, Johnny and Edgar Winter. He knew all their songs and more, how they were written and the stories behind their creation. Mom was stuck in the 1950s listening to old country music, the Carter family, Patsy Cline, Hank Williams, Bill Monroe, Don Messers, anyone of the sort. She didn't know some modern music, Bob Dylan, The Doors, The Guess Who, Joni Mitchell, but she couldn't match my father. My auntie said mom told them dad was like a jukebox with all the info on all the hottest bands. That made him like a god in northern Saskatchewan, where no one knew anything about rock or Led Zeppelin or Jimi Hendrix or anything. It made him irresistible, mom said. The side of my mom's face was blue. It wasn't that way before she left. 
and her voice sounded the way I didn't like. Mushroom examined her, and I knew he could see her broken glasses sticking out of her pocket when she went into the back room. He pushed himself up from the table, swore, and reached for his axe. I thought he was going to kill my dad. Josh, Jerry, and I all started crying. Stop, Jeremy, Cookham yelled. She pulled the axe out of his hand and threw it beside the stove. This is between them, she said, her voice sounding that way it had when she spoke with the mosquitoes. Musham sneered and stared out the window. Dad didn't notice. I could see him drumming his hands against the steering wheel. Mom came back with some things. Sorry, Mom, Dad. Next time we'll stay for Bannock. She picked up our toys and piled us into the car. She was like a whirlwind. We didn't even have a chance to say goodbye. As soon as we were in the car, Dad floored it. The wheels kicked up a cloud of dirt, and I could, I could just see my Kokum and Musham waving us through it. And that's chapter one. So good. I had a really, like, that was so fun to read. Um, there's some pictures too. Like, this is the mom and dad. And then there's a picture of Mushum and Cookum, which, if you don't know, would be like grandma and grandpa. And so he's obviously Metis. Like, Michif is a Metis language. So, yeah, I hope you read this. It looks pretty awesome. So enjoy and have a good day.